Silvarum by Dean Cooter. Narrated by Dan Bottomley. Chapter 5 Patterns in the Mist. A grey sky frowned upon the north gate. Pockets of fog hung in the nearby fields and crept up from the dark chasm that encircled the castle walls. A group of gate guards gathered at the end of a lowered drawbridge and peered out into the gloom of the early morning light. Puffs of icy breath escaped their lips as they quietly spoke to one another. Can you tell me more about these people we're waiting for? asked a young guard named Belris. His nervous eyes danced upon the road as he anticipated the approaching caravan. Sergeant Brian Woods, an older, grim-faced guard, worn down by decades of battle and adventure, spat a wad of liquid onto the muddy road. A bit of rancid juice dangled from the knotted mess that he called a beard. They're not people, they're monsters. The sergeant paused in mid-speech and pressed a finger to one side of his nose. As he blew, a stream of grey-green snot sprayed out of the other nostril. The young guard cringed in disgust and then stared in mild fascination down at the wad of bubbling spit and goo. It had attracted a group of insects and flies. He shifted the heavy sword that hung from his belt and looked up into the fog. What exactly do you mean by monsters? Exactly what I said, replied Brian. They're horrible and awful and hideous and any number of other negative adjectives you can think of. What more do you need to know about them to perform your duties? Belris cleared his throat. Yes, sir. What I meant to ask was, what is it about these creatures specifically that makes them so horrible? Are they horrible looking or horrible sounding? Or do they smell horrible? One moment, Private said Brian with a raise of his hand. He motioned to another guard who stood behind them near the gatehouse. The gate guard trotted across the bridge, his heavy armour jingling with each stride. Yes, sir, he said. Corporal, said Brian. Where do we stand with the riflemen I requested? Sir, they're in place and ready atop the curtain wall. All of them? Two, sir. Two? I requested six. Why would we only have two? The corporal stirred and cleared his throat. Captain Hammonet felt this exchange only required two riflemen. Did he? replied Brian. Well, I hope Captain Hammonet has made the correct decision for a change. It would be a shame if there was trouble and we required the firepower. Remember what happened last time? Yes, sir, replied the corporal. Brian thought for a moment and then shook his head in frustration. Fine. Return to your post and wait for my signal. Our guests should be arriving presently. When I wave to you, open the gate to let the captain and his guards out to greet them. Do you understand your orders? Yes, sir. Very well, Corporal. The gate guard turned without another word and dashed back to his post. His heavy boots echoed against the wooden planks of the drawbridge. Brian turned back towards the mist-enshrouded road and gazed out into the emptiness. Two riflemen. Seriously. On top of that, he had only been provided a handful of fighters for the encounter. This strategy had become a dangerous pattern. Brian Woods had observed in recent weeks the relaxed posture of this castle outpost and its apathetic leadership. Trade with these creatures had become more frequent and lucrative over the past year, but it did not justify a decrease in strength during minor encounters such as these. Hostilities had subsided only a few years ago. It was still vital to maintain a show of force, regardless of the insignificance or scale of the engagement. Brian recalled when he first arrived at the castle. Anyway, said Belris, what's so horrible about them? Where do they come from? What do these things look like? Brian snapped out of his reverie and glared. The boy took a few awkward steps backward in surprise. For heaven's sake, private, said Brian. Isn't it a little early in the morning for history lessons? I would really love to explain to you the ins and outs of these monsters that we're standing here waiting for, but honestly, 
I'm freezing cold and exhausted. Brian stamped his feet and rubbed his hands together to try and generate some warmth. Maybe if you scare up a hot cup of coffee, I might pursue this conversation further. Another guard that stood just behind them chuckled in agreement. Aye, he said, and don't forget that I take mine with a little cream and two spoons of sugar. Belrus winced at the sergeant's rebuke. Forgive me, sir, but I'm just a bit anxious this morning. I tend to ask a lot of stupid questions when I'm nervous. I noticed, replied Brian. Ah, yes, said the young guard and let out a forced laugh. As you are aware, I was just recently posted to the North Gate, and I've heard about our dealings with these creatures, of course, but I really don't know much more. Is there nothing else that you can tell me? Brian expelled a loud sigh. He realised that he was not going to escape this mindless conversation by ignoring the young man or making more jokes. He would have to ease this fresh recruit's fears by answering his questions. This was one of the responsibilities that he had recently been given, right? To manage and maintain the defence and morale of the castle walls. Of course, answering questions about what they were waiting for would more than likely cause the boy to be even more fearful. Why did Count Zaran insist on sending these kids with no experience out to defend the main gate? Unfortunately, Brian knew the answer to that question. Veterans were in short supply. Those with any real combat experience had been reassigned to fight on the Northern Front, or they had been lost during one of the Count's numerous expeditions into Nexathia. Brian raised his eyes out of the muck and looked back at the young guard. He took a deep breath and scratched at his beard. Although he hated to admit it, he had to acknowledge that he was just as scared of these creatures as this boy. Brian had engaged with these beings on multiple occasions, engaged them in battle. He knew firsthand what they were capable of and the amount of fear that they could inflict on most ordinary men. Brian wiped a dangling strand of brown spit from his beard and grinned. All right, lad. Do you want a history lesson? In the few remaining moments that we have before these things arrive, I'll tell you whatever you want to know. Belris smiled and stepped a few paces closer. Thank you, sir, he said as he adjusted his chest plate. First of all, what are these things actually called? I've only ever heard of them referred to as the tomb spawn. They call themselves Nexathians. We refer to them as tomb spawn because... That's where they come from, deep within the tombs and subterranean crypts under the horrible city of Nexathia. Regardless of their name, however, they're truly hideous. I wasn't joking with you earlier. If you haven't seen anything like them before, I warn you, it will be a shock. I haven't, sir, and I do believe you, replied Belrus. The only creatures I've ever seen were the flying reptiles from the eastern swamps, and that was from a great distance. We were stationed high in the cliffs and could barely see them flying and circling from afar. I also saw a group of wild preview during my first patrol, about six months ago, I think. Brian frowned. How old are you, Private? I just turned 18 in August, sir. This will certainly be an experience that you'll not soon forget. Breve new are slow and stupid and easy to tame. These Nexathians, on the other hand, are cunning and deliberate. They're devious. They also possess an ability that's superior to our weapons of steel and fire. They use thought. Thought? replied Belrus. Aye, they use thought as a weapon... For those who are weak-minded or fearful, the Nexathians can paralyse with a thought, leaving them frozen as victims for other things. Other things? he asked. What other things? There are a few types, said Brian. Not all Nexathians use thought weapons. Some are regular fighters, like you and me. They're still extremely dangerous, but they don't seem to possess the power of the others. Then there are the creatures that are like priests or holy men. I'm not entirely sure what you call them. I've only seen one or two of their kind before. But they're hideous, and they use magic. 
magic, replied Belris. He pulled back the hood of his cloak and wiped away a line of sweat. Why didn't they tell me any of this during my training? Nay, hey, said Brian. You wanted to know all the details. You're going to have to deal with that and still do your job. Is that clear? Now pull yourself together, Private. You'll be fine. Belris gulped and took a deep breath. He tried to control his breathing. Yes, sir. I just need a few more moments, and I think I'll be all right. Brian released his gaze upon the young man and turned back to the road. Unfortunately, you don't have a few more moments, he said. Something is approaching from the mist. Belris turned from the sergeant and peered into the fog. A chill silence washed over him as he strained his eyes on the swirling haze. Shapes emerged. All his previous thoughts were immediately erased. His breathing quickly picked up again, and he felt his temples pound with fear. His heart rose into his throat as he started to panic. A shape emerged from the fog. Then two. Cloaked figures rode upon animals with many legs. Hoods concealed the riders' heads as they sat upon high saddles. Another figure was perched from a similar seat atop an enormous grey-green reptile. The creature's neck was so long that its head was hidden within the heights of the gloom. Only two red eyes could be discerned in the darkness. Other obscure figures walked or glided ominously on either side of the beasts. Wisps of white fog quietly swirled over the road as they broke through the foreboding veil. The encounter had transpired too quickly for Belris. He desperately strained his mind to process what he was witnessing. Never in his eighteen years had he seen or even heard of beings so abnormal and terrifying, or float in such a bizarre manner. He yearned to be far away from this miserable road. He wanted to be safe at home, causing trouble with his older brothers, or teasing his sisters as they played with their dolls. At that moment, his thoughts were so confused and uncertain that he could not even remember how he had brought himself into this situation. Belris glanced to his side, noticing the sergeant's stare. Collect your wits, boy, he said between clenched teeth. Do not show your fear to these creatures. This will be over soon enough. Brian Woods raised his hand to signal the corporal at the gatehouse. The clinking and strain of heavy chains echoed across the bridge as the main gate door was raised. It bellowed a deep boom, locking into its upright position. Flanked on either side by two knights, each armed with elaborate broadswords and heavy suits of decorated plate armour, Captain Hammonet cautiously walked towards the end of the drawbridge. Wooden boards creaked and moaned under the stress of their heavy boots. The three men reached Belris and Brian and halted. They stared into the mist at the approaching caravan. The captain's hand rested eagerly upon the hilt of his sword and his fingers twitched in anticipation. Like Belris, he was boyish and untested. Barely a man, he had been quickly promoted through the ranks because of his family name, rather than his leadership ability or skill in battle. As with most of the assembled gate guards, he had not had dealings with these creatures before. They watched as the last form emerged from the mist. Thirteen of the ghoulish figures gathered at the end of the drawbridge and stood motionless. Six were saddled atop colossal blue-grey spiders. Chaotic legs tickled the puddle-filled road as hundreds of arachnid eyes peered mockingly back at the guards. Two adjacent figures, clad in purple robes, were mounted on the backs of hideously large reptilian beasts. Their prehistoric necks towered over the humans. A curious collection of skulls dangled from iron chains. The spider riders were mounted warriors. They sat low on the backs of the arachnids and clasped blades of obscene shape and sharpness. Green liquid dripped from the tips of their weapons, sizzling into the mud with each drop. Belris gazed along one of the ghastly necks until he met the stare of two red eyes. Puffs of crystal blue mist emanated from nostrils high above. The remaining figures were on foot at the head of the group. They were clad in flowing cloaks, two of which pulled a covered wagon. Captain Hammonet cleared his throat and addressed the caravan. 
Well met, travellers. What news do you bring from the northern lands? His feeble voice was lost in the fog. The Nexathians made no response. Disturbing clicks issued from the spider's jaws and legs. The young captain turned to his guards in confusion. At that moment, one of the massive reptilian necks slowly lowered its head to the ground. Its rider emerged from the saddle and casually walked along the neck to the muddy road. It strode confidently to the front of the group, standing before the captain and his men. A large hood concealed its face. Pray tell, mine captain, said a voice that was both high-pitched and horribly deep. Several of the gate guards positioned along the parapet gasped aloud in terror. For although we have clearly presented to you in plain view the substance you desire, I fail to see the light dust that is owed to us. I only see frosty men and children before me. The captain was too startled by the creature's hideous voice to process the insult, nor did he have a clear understanding of the intent of the question. His head pounded. A murky veil of uncertainty blanketed his thoughts and dulled his reasoning. Sire, he replied after an anxious moment, we felt a proper reception was appropriate before we brought forth the goods. He rubbed his eyes painfully. It's our custom to greet our guests openly and exchange news to... The voice interrupted the captain's faltering monologue with a long hiss that ended in disturbing, cackling laughter. Nay, human, we care not for your customs, nor your shallow hospitality. We have travelled many leagues, over stone and wood, through space and time, to acquire what we are owed. Bring it hither, and let us be done with your company. As you wish, replied the captain. He motioned over his shoulder toward the open gate. Two guards pushed a wooden cart across the bridge. The sound of its spinning wheels pierced the captain's perception. He grasped at consciousness and felt the world slip away.